Now that we've talked about asexual reproduction, mitosis, we're going to move into a different type of reproduction called meiosis. So first, let's do a quick comparison. What's, what is asexual reproduction? What is sexual reproduction? So asexual reproduction is when a single individual passes their genes to an offspring, all the DNA coming from a single parent. We don't have any kind of shuffling of chromosomes. No cells are fusing together, just an exact copy getting passed on. So this would include mitosis. This would include binary fission. There are some other examples I'll give you in a moment. And every genetically identical individual from that parent would technically be a clone of that parent. Now, sexual reproduction involves two cells merging together. So you get an offspring that's got unique qualities because it's inherited half of its chromosomes from each of the parents. It does not necessarily mean that you have to have two separate parents. It does mean you have to have two separate cells. So for example, some plants are hermaphrodites where the flower of the plant actually produces pollen, which is basically the sperm, and produces eggs. Those plants, if the pollen fertilizes an egg, are technically reproducing sexually, not asexually, because you do have two cells fusing together, and each of those cells has only half of the chromosomes. And um, even if I produced multiple egg cells, my egg cells are not all going to be identical. And this will make more sense after we finish talking about meiosis, how each egg or sperm is unique. So fusing two eggs together, even if they were from the same parent, you actually would not get a clone of that parent. And this just shows uh, some different types of asexual reproduction. And um, in all of these cases, what you get, again, are offspring that are identical to the parent. So you don't need a partner. A single individual can make these offspring. And you're going to make multiple copies of, of a gene combination that if it's a good gene combination and that's a healthy plant, it's going to make more plants just like it. So that would be a benefit of asexual reproduction, that it would be very quick, efficient, and make lots of copies of something that's already surviving. However, the benefit of sexual reproduction is actually the fact that it creates variations. Because the truth is, not every trait that an organism has might be a benefit, and especially if the environment changes. So uh, basically, sexual reproduction offers an evolutionary advantage, because if the environment does change, it gets colder, um, you know, the oxygen levels go down, a, a virus comes through, then the fact that there's organisms with different gene combinations means that somebody in that population may be able to survive. The species will still survive because the ones that are immune to that disease or that have thicker fur or that have longer necks, you know, or have darker, darker fur or darker feathers, you know, or can fly for longer periods of time, these things may give them a benefit so that some organisms from the species will still survive and everybody doesn't get wiped out. If everybody's identical, then something that kills one will kill all of them. So that's the benefit of sexual reproduction. All right, um, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about genes. So a gene is a segment of your DNA that carries information to make specific proteins. We usually think of genes as coding for your traits, which is true, but technically what genes are, are coding for is the making of specific proteins. And a chromosome, one chromosome, can have 5,000 5, to 25,000 genes. So don't think of a chromosome as, oh yeah, you have a chromosome and it codes for your blood type. Yeah, it, you do, but that also codes for 5,000 other things besides just your blood type. And this is why having an extra or missing chromosome would be so detrimental. Because if you're missing 25,000 proteins that you normally need, um, you know, that's going to be a big problem. Or if you're making 25,000 extra proteins. Now, this is where we get into the terms diploid and haploid. So if a cell, and in us, a good example of this would be body cells or somatic cells. You should know that word somatic. Um, they have two copies of every chromosome. And we, this is one of the reasons that we made the karyotype so that you would see this. That you have pair number one and then you had pair number two, and their bands matched, and they were similar, the same size, and all that sort of thing. Um, they are called homologous chromosomes, or a homologous pair of chromosomes. And a cell that has two copies of each chromosome is called a diploid cell. And sometimes this rep is represented by 2n, because n is sort of the base number. Um, and then having two copies of each one, that's where we get 2n. 
Um, these chromosomes, again, would have the same bands. They would carry genes with the same traits, but that doesn't mean that they're exactly identical. For example, chromosome number nine carries the genes for the blood type. That doesn't mean that both of my, gene, my chromosome nines carry genes for the same blood type. As a matter of fact, I happen to know that one of my parents was A, and my other parent was blood type O. So um, I know, because my blood type is A, that one of my copies of chromosome 9 carries the code for blood type A, the other one carries the code for blood type O. So they carry information about the same traits, but it doesn't mean that they carry the exact same DNA sequences. In fact, they typically do not. Haploid cells, and in us, that would only be sex cells or gametes, sperm and egg cells, have only one copy of each chromosome. So that, that is called the haploid number or the N number of chromosomes. So in a karyotype, we're looking at the diploid number. Two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, and two sex chromosomes. And there would be a total of 46 chromosomes in that karyotype. Now in humans, so our diploid number is 46, or our 2N number is 46. That means we actually have 23 homologous pairs when we pair them up. 22 of those pairs are called autosomes, and then that last pair is called the sex chromosomes. And XX is for female, and XY is for male. Now, just keep in mind that not every organism determines the sex of the individual um, based on chromosomes. For example, alligators, the temperature of the nest, if it's a, above a certain temperature, they all come out male. If it's below a certain temperature, they all come out female. So temperature determines it. In certain fish species, um, there's a male, and he sort of has a group of females. And when that male dies, the largest female turns into a male and takes over the group. So not every organism has sex determined in the same way that we do, but we do have, um, and mammals, as far as I know, all mammals are determined this way. XX is female and XY is male. Um, here is just another picture just showing, again, the difference between diploid and haploid. So diploid two copies of every chromosome, haploid, one copy of each chromosome, and notice only one sex chromosome. And also keep in mind, this has nothing to do with whether the chromosomes are sticks or X's. It may look like these are sticks. I think they're actually X's with the two um, sister chromatids kind of sticking together. But keep in mind that this is, it's not like this because it's an X is diploid and having a stick is haploid. It's the number of copies of chromosome number one, the number of copies of chromosome number two. If it's before S, then all the chromosomes are going to look like this. Um, if it's after S, all the chromosomes are going to look like this. But haploid and diploid doesn't have anything to do with whether they're sticks or Xs. It has to do with how many copies you have of each chromosome. Uh, and this is just another illustration. Again, this is showing a diploid cell. And they're trying to, they made them two different colors, mater, a maternal chromosome, meaning came from the mom and one that came from the dad. So this is one homologous pair. This is a homologous pair. And then this is a homologous pair. So there are two copies of each chromosome. Therefore, the 2N number for this cell would be 6. The haploid number for this organism would be 3, meaning a sperm or an egg would only have one random copy of each of these. So it might get this one, one medium one, one small one, but it would be random which one that would be. All right, so in order for sexual reproduction to occur, each parent is going to give only one copy, as I mentioned, from their pair. And it's going to be random which one that is. And that way, when fertilization happens, you're going to restore the chromosome number. So meiosis, the whole point of meiosis is that it is the process that's going to cut the number of chromosomes in half from 2N to N, creating gametes, which can then fuse together. So a single haploid cell from a human, like an egg or a sperm, would have 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome. Now, an egg cell, that sex chromosome would have to be an X, because remember, females are XX, so the only option would be to give an X. Males, since they are XY, they could either give an X or a Y. So if they give an X and that gets fertilized, that would become a girl. If they give a sperm with a Y and that gets fertilized, that would become a boy. And so that's how gender would be determined, again, in humans and in, as far as I know, uh, mammals. Meiosis and fertilization alternate in all sexual life cycles. So in other words, any organism that reproduces sexually is going to have my uh, meiosis happen at some point to cut the chromosome number in half, 
And then fertilization happened at some point where two cells are going to fuse together to restore that diploid number. So in humans, that the only haploid cells are our sex cells, the sperm and egg. And then when fertilization happens, this is our zygote, which is the fertilized egg, and that undergoes only mitosis and cell differentiation to grow into uh, an adult human. Other organisms have different life cycles, which I'm not going to get into the sexual life cycles of different organisms, but I just bring this up. Um, it's not on your test. Just to show you that this is animals, or mammals in particular, um, vertebrate animals. So we are diploid our whole life, and then only gametes are haploid. Um, if we look at protists and also fungi are this way as well, they are actually haploid. A, a mushroom is actually made of haploid cells. So they have a different life cycle than we do. Um, two haploid cells fuse together and make a zygote, and then that undergoes meiosis and goes back to being haploid again. And some plants have what's called an alternation of generations where they actually have an entire portion of their life cycle where they're haploid, and about it's about half of their life cycle, and then another half where they're diploid. Again, this won't be on a test, but I just wanted to show you that not every organism has the same sexual life cycle we have. They all have meiosis, and they all have fertilization somewhere, but they don't necessarily spend the same amount of their life in haploid that we do, or diploid that we do. Um, it is possible for haploid and diploid cells to undergo mitosis. Since mitosis just makes exact copies, then it doesn't really matter. Any cell can undergo mitosis. As long as the chromosomes have gone through S and you have X-shaped chromosomes, then a cell can undergo mitosis and split those in half. But only diploid cells can undergo meiosis because what's going to happen in meiosis, again, is that that chromosome number is going to get cut in half and you have to be diploid in order for that to happen. All right, so that brings us to the actual steps in, my, in meiosis. So one thing that mitosis and meiosis have in common is that they're both, they both start with S, normal cell cycle. When the cell gets to meiosis, uh, actual meiosis, it's divided into two phases, meiosis one and meiosis two. And there's gonna be two cell divisions. So meiosis one is gonna cut the chromosome number in half and you're gonna make two cells. And then meiosis two is gonna have a second division. So you're actually gonna end up in the end with four cells. And this is gonna be a difference between mitosis and meiosis. Also, each of the daughter cells in meiosis is going to only have half the chromosome number of the parent. Whereas in mitosis, it made exact copies. This is going to actually make cells with only half the chromosome number. So first stage, meiosis one. So this is what actually cuts the chromosome number in half. And the biggest difference here, it has prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, etc., is that in mitosis, if you had four chromosomes, they would have lined up like this in a straight line and then the X's would have gotten cut in half like this. But in meiosis one, the chromosomes are gonna line up side by side like this with their partner. And at the end of meiosis one, you're gonna basically have half the number of chromosomes. So notice there's still X's, but we went from four chromosomes, now each of these cells only has two chromosomes. So meiosis one is gonna cut the chromosome number in half, and this is important. Also, we can mathematically calculate how many different possible combinations of chromosomes we can get. It's gonna to be two to the N, where N is the haploid number. So for us, N is 23, remember? We have 23 pairs or 23 different chromosomes. So that means that there's basically two to the 23rd possibilities for every egg cell, the combination of chromosomes. And this is why I said, even if I made two eggs and somehow was able to fuse them together, I would be the par only parent of that child. But the 46 chromosomes would technically be a new combination because of all the possible outcomes here. Um, if N is five, if there's 32 possibilities, two to the fifth power. Um, and this diagram sort of shows what I mean by independent assortment, this next diagram. So we end up with two cells that are haploid at the end of meiosis one. We have cut the chromosome number in half. So notice this is showing a cell with just four chromosomes. N would be two, the N number, the haploid number. So there are four possible outcomes, and these are the four. Two blue, two pink, 
Big blue with little pink. Big pink with little blue. These are the four possible.